Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the start of a new campaign in Kaizo Redux. I'm your host, Mr. Mobile Lover. As we're playing as a French national state led by a certain PP guy, the situation of the French Republic history. If you want to skip the first couple minutes or so, because I will read through all this, because I've never played this nation before, and I can't believe I'm actually playing it right now, but... History. The Third Republic fell in the same way it came to be, in defeat by the German arms and facing socialist unrest. As the Civil War followed, the Communist Revolution of 1920 eventually came to a close. The government chose exile instead of surrender, having retreated to Marseille. They embarked with the French Navy towards Algiers, hoping that this temporary situation would soon be resolved as a newly created Federation of Communes of France would undoubtedly either quickly collapse on itself or be put down by the Bosch. Neither happened, of course, and instead a peace treaty was concluded between the German Empire and uh, the Commune, with little or no regret towards the exiled government, of course. The Commune was recognized as a successor of the French Republic by most of the newly German aligned world, while the exiles remained seen as a legitimate government by those who had fought beside them in the Valkyrie. But the refugees refused to be cowed. They renewed their claim as a legitimate government of all of France and her empire and the commitment to the Entente, preparing for any opportunity to strike. However, the aftermath of the exile proved highly unstable, with the remnants of the parliament and mainstream parties thrown into chaos by the defeat in exile. The great commander, Ferdinand Falk, seized control in a bloodless push, ruling at the head of a thinly veiled junta until his death in 1929. His shoes were filled by the, with ease by his fellow war hero, Philippe Petain, um, the lion of, of course, of Verdun. Um, uh, where is he? Where is he? My bad, I lost it. Uh, Catalan's rule has so far been perceived as less autocratic than his predecessors, with a marshal willing to delegate the assembly and civilian politicians when needs be, and choosing to cooperate with the parties of the center right as well as the corporatist Croix de Fou. Nevertheless, he is alone, uh, the leader of France, and the constitution remains suspended and ignored while the military continues to dominate both part politicals or politics and the economy, and parliament often sidelined. However, Pétain's premier, General Maurice Janine, has a less than admirable record of uh, incompetence, and his many blunders may soon catch up with him and this government, though it's a cursed communard, but the political situation currently as is. The circumstances of the revolution and exile convince Marshal Pétain and a large par popula portion of the population that only a dynamic and authoritarian rule can save France, at least until the metropole is liberated. However, both far right royalists and the liberals are increasingly dissatisfied with the regime and are slowly becoming restless for change. It's not helped by the perceived incompetence by the premier, um, of Maurice Janin, who has already endangered the government with his blunders before and may well do so again. Even Pétain's allies in the Croix de Fou and FR are starting to grow impatient with the political stagnation and De La Roque's uh, corporatists are increasingly hindered by internal factionalism, making them hardly the ally they once were. To put it simply, the Junta is now slowly but surely losing political credibility, and is now mainly held together by the prestige of Pétain. The Junta did, however, make several attempts to assert its power, such as temporarily renaming the French Republic the French National State. The notion of state reaffirming the temporary suspension of full democracy and of national, asserting itself as the only state truly representing the French people, as opposed to the universalist and internationalist character of the communist government, and now growing concerns. If this lack of civilian support isn't enough, trust in the marshal is starting to erode within the army, the backbone of the regime. Pétain's favoritism towards his protégés has put many in key positions, and although they are certainly competent, many officers are left behind while others worry that this could encourage doctrinal rot, that Pétain is surrounding himself with a yes-man. Increasingly, the debate is uh, flaring up within his clique between General de Gaulle and uh, Admiral Darlan, whose proposals for the liberation are starkly different, of course, over how the military should prepare to free the metropole. <clears throat> The most important problem facing the nation, however, is simply its situation in exile. Although in Algeria, officially annexed as part of France as an overseas department in the late 19th century, exiles and Pied Noirs, settlers make up a significant part of the population, and major, some, in some major cities even making up a majority. Overall, Europeans are still a small minority ruling over millions of indignés, who despite being considered as Frenchmen are essentially second-class citizens, subject to heavy taxes and forced labor, with rule from Algiers enforced by native elites and the army, of course. Since the defeat in the Velk Creek, the colonial situation is precarious, unrest is ruthlessly put down, recent families were badly managed, and syndicals and pan-Arab agents spread propaganda against colonial authorities. However, most traditional indigenous elites are still loyal to France, and there exists a growing class of French-educated native and native war veterans who, despite wanting reform, remain loyal. But one thing is clear, if the government is careless, further unrest and perhaps even revolts are bound to happen. Be careful, a failure to keep the resistance in non-core African states under the 60 will result, result in revolts. I'm sure it's going to be fine, as we prepare for liberation. The situation in continental Europe is quickly becoming more and more tense, with elections imminent among the communist traitors, whose relations with the Germans are more tense than ever. There's no point in denying that a conflict even worse than the horrors of the Great War is around the corner, and the conflict will be the only chance we ever get to liberate the metropole from syndicalist tyranny. As such, we must review our military capabilities and seek to resolve debates within the army. In which I want to go with the Gaul plan for this campaign. It's my first campaign doing this, but um, I want to go mobile warfare, because we don't have a, even though we don't have a really big industry, 
which really sucks. We don't have that much manpower either, so we'll see. Philip Patton has accepted Charles de Gaulle's proposals for military reform, while with de Gaulle having been appointed as a new chief of staff. The French military will now set about implementing de Gaulle's reform plan, centered around the idea of a small but heavily capable army with high-quality training and equipment, and also concentrated breakthroughs by armored units. So, uh, Louis Franchet d'Espressi retires in death of a friend. I'll be honest, I do not speak French. I took one year French in high school, and I don't remember anything. So, poignant news has struck the nation today as Marshal Louis Franchet d'Espressi, hero of the Great War and Pétain's long-standing chief of staff, has gone into retirement. D'Espressi is an old man now, clearly feels unable to lead men in war as successfully as he did 20 years ago, and so few can blame him for stepping back. Nevertheless, Pétain's government has lost a vital political ally and a popular fi uh, figure capable of rounding up support for the junta. Furthermore, without the unifying figure of a desperati or desperi, debates and military are likely to come to surface as Patel will be forced to choose a new chief of staff. Farewell to a true patriot. Oh. The death of a friend. His Majesty George V, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and other British dominions beyond the seas, King and Defender of the Faith, Emperor of India, Friend of France, our great ally during the Great War and since their exile, as well as a personal friend of Marshal Patan since the two met on the battlefields two decades ago, has died today at 70 years old. That's a long sentence. Though the situation is unfortunately tense at home, given the magnitude of the event, it is important for the Entente that the Lion attends the funeral of George V, and the coronation, of course, of his son Edward, and more personally for Patan, it is important to mourn a friend and ally, who, like him, so oversaw the exile of his people after bloody revolutions in their homelands, and like him, was so hardly dedicated to one day come back and retake what is rightfully theirs. And so Marshal Patan embarked on a special transatlantic flight, ready to honor the memory of a friend but celebrate a new era of Anglo French friendship. The king is dead. Long live the king! And da non. Uh, uh, breaks with Croix de Fou. Francois de la Roque, Catholic corporatist Croix de Fou, a major ally of the Junta and the Assembly, today suffered a significant setback. The party has long been a broad tent coalition, united mainly by de la Roque's own charisma and by a shared distrust for liberal democracy. However, the tensions caused by this have clearly reached a boiling point with some of the party's hardliners under Joseph Darnan, splitting off entirely to form a new Chevalier de Glaive Parti. Claiming inspiration from the Legionnaires in Romania and seeking to defend French racial purity and restore French power in Europe, Darnan has notably proclaimed his absolute loyalty to the Pétain government, in what we can only assume a ploy for influence in the Junta. Nevertheless, Darnan's group remains on the extreme fringe, and his radicalism is regarded with suspicion by much of the population, while Pétain's allies in the Junta have no interest in working with him. If anything, his split from the Croix de Fou has harmed de la Roque through exposing the divisions in his own party more than it has helped Darnan. We can safely ignore this lunatic, for now, and a successor to Desperi. Over a week now has passed since Louis-Franchet Desperi retired, and Pétain still, still held back on announcing his successor. That's because Des Esperi, uh, retirement has robbed the military of a unifying and respected figure, capable of papering over the growing doctrinal divides as a younger generation of officers seek to find solutions to the military's decline on one side. General Charles de Gaulle and his allies are known for the conviction that the nation can, in its current circumstances, only sustain a relatively small army and thus should have focused on professionalism and a high quality of training and equipment. Th furthermore, de Gaulle is passionate in his belief that tanks are the future of warfare, and that arms should develop elite armed units, which can achieve concentrated rapid breakthroughs. Opposing de Gaulle's faction, though, is a group of officers centered on Ar Admiral Francois Darlan and General Maxime Wayne who follow a more traditional approach that is often more popular among the older generations of officers. Drawing on the traditional French idea of a citizen-soldier, and the need for strong naval and air power in order to land in the metropole, they argue that for a large as army as circumstances allow, alongside a greatly strengthened navy and air force, with the three forces acting in greater coordination by now, however, the pressure from both factions of the military, from civilian politicians eager to see the military reform one way or another, and from public opinion, has grown too strong for Patan to procrastinate any longer, and we must appoint a successor. Darlan and Zbegin? That's, that's pretty good. Small leap force is what we need to bring into Gaul. Like I said, I do want this one. Is this going to be possible? I don't know, but the De Gaulle plan. Philip Patan has accepted Charles de Gaulle's proposals for military reform, with de Gaulle having been appointed as a new chief of staff. The French military now set about implementing de Gaulle's reform plan, centered around the idea of a small but heavily capable army with high quality training and equipment, also concentrating breakthroughs by armored units. Rumors of Mordecai's imminent demise. Jean Jules Henri Mordecai has been long serving the armed forces of France, but as the political stage of our exiled regime begins to change its main players as the winds of change blow across their Saharan home. Mordecai has begun to fear for his own life. Rumors have spread that his enemies within the radical right, within the French, uh, French left, or even the Algerian natives seek to gut this wounded old man unless he interfere with the coming shift. And so Mordecai has begun to look for options. Journalist Mordecai Massou and Armand Huy, both old allies and confidants of Mordecai, now work within the Belgian government Congo Free State and could provide a safe haven for him should he flee. However, the dark heart of the dark continent is fraught with dangers and filled with death and disease, especially to outsider colonials who know little of how to live in such a foreign land. And some believe that the German colonial system in Africa is looming towards collapse. Luckily, Mordecai has some experience surviving in Africa due to his terms of time serving in Algeria both during the 1880s and again during the rise of the communards in France or in Paris. But the sand dunes of Algeria are also a far different base to tame than the dangerous jungle even of the Congo. However, it's not certain that he's in any real danger or it could just be for the paranoia of old age sitting in and the rumors could be entirely false, but the truth is uncertain. What, a, what should the aging you don't do in his trying time? 
No one ever harm him. Perhaps it's best if he takes his leave. The Lion in Canada. After a six-hour transatlantic flight, Marshal Patton arrived in Ottawa. Greeted by Prime Minister Mackenzie King and a large crowd of Canadians, mostly Quebecois, Quebec people, who see the state visit as a renewal for Anglo-French cooperation. Then they drove to Windsor, where the late King Emperor George had asked to be buried. After a grandiose and emotional ceremony where Patton was finally able to say farewell to a personal friend and ally, he took a tour of Ontario and Quebec, greeted all the way along as a friend of the Empire, before meeting with King Edward VIII. In a pre-planned move, the two men shook hands in front of the media of the world, and the new king declared that no matter the struggles the future holds, for the French and British nations would fight always side by side in this great crusade against the cynical threat later on. The two men held a private talk, discussing current issues facing the Entente, the policies that both men were planning on undertaking, as well as the inevitable prospect of war. The mutual undying commitment of both nations to each other was, of course, renewed, announcing even stronger bonds within the Entente. The town return home. Um, I'll let you know, as you can probably tell from the thumbnail and title, we're going to go uh, nap, nap up here, probably. Uh, Pre-liberation, post-liberation. Oh. Effects, pre-liberation, of course, effects, post-liberation paths. Um, what's pre-liberation? To get Pétain, after he resigns, declare martial law, democracy. I kind of want to go action Francois, just because we can. I'll quote a few, though. Oh. And the kingdom, after Jeannin resigns, meet with either Martin or Delaroque, and refuse their demands, reach out to the far-right leagues, when Maras asks you to repeal the law of exile, except, uh, I have no idea about this one. No one ever harm him. So we got a lot of different options here, which I kind of actually really like. So what is post-liberation? Uh, Post-pass for de Gaulle. Um, democracy, CDF, monarchy. Action from Swell, don't collaborate with no, A bit of truth. Having taken stock of our military and industrial capacity, we can no longer hide from the simple harsh fact. As it stands, our economy and army know what is required to successfully land in the metropole and then defeat the commune. Urgent and drastic reforms are urgently needed, and public pressure on the Premier Janine is reaching a fever pitch. Bhutan himself is said to be deeply anchored by the findings, demanding that Janine do something, and possibly growing more sympathetic to the voices within his government that want to see a further consolidation of the junta. We await his move. Um, so we'll go with the Gaul, the trans saharan Railway, would actually be pretty nice, but I don't want to lose that political power. So that, that would really suck. One following must be two, two, two. I mean, yeah, we heard of political power and consumer goods. Jesus Christ. Phase two. I'll probably do a new crackdown, maybe. French Union. Yeah, reset French rule. Um, Industrialize the colonies would be quite nice as well. Okay, well, there's a lot of different paths you can go over here as National France, which is really cool. So we can't do anything over here yet. It's a big old tree and whatnot, so... Yeah, I like... Um, oh, we have even more down here. Oh, La Croix de Fou. Ah. Wow. There's a lot of different paths you can take, which is really cool, actually. Third Republic. Eternal France. France Eternal, La Liberation. Destiny has accomplished a purpose. It'd be kind of cool if, I don't know if this is true or not, but like, um, if once we liberate or go down some route, we can eliminate like all these extra paths. Just because, while it wouldn't be bad to do, it makes it a little cleaner. Let's see. Daily Naval XP is good to get. Daily Air XP would be good to get. How about Daily Army XP, though? Um, which one do we want? No, oh, we gotta get that one. Better call plan, of course. Uh, which doesn't give us daily air army XP, which sucks. Military research. Our current research, our R&D capabilities are severely lacking. We need to greatly expand funding for research facilities in order to develop the military technology required for modern army. We can put off resolving this issue for no longer, therefore it's time to greatly increase funding for the military research. Professional army would be good, nice as well. Um, there's nothing here. More fuel consumption, which sucks, but whatever. Yeah, is there no daily army XP game? We get stuff for navy and stuff, which makes sense, because we don't really focus on that too much, but still... Subordinate the Navy. Naval XP gaining goes down. Air support. Um, Ministry of the Air. The Ministry of the Air is tasked with both organizing air and our aeronautical efforts, such as civilian air transport, air, air forces, which proved so useful in the Great War, and which, according to our military thinkers, will prove an even more critical in the upcoming war. As technological progress enables new air tactics and strategies. Ministry of Naval Affairs, or N Naval Affairs. The Ministry of Naval Affairs, uh, once tasked with overseeing the administration of both the colonies and their naval forces, is now solely dedicated to the needs of the Navy. Control of the Mediterranean will be essential to take the Metropole, as such a ministry will make sure that our Navy can stand up to the international. Janin's plan. Uh, Pétain's premier, Joris Maurice Janin, has a few redeeming features, of course. He is uncharismatic, unmotivated, incompetent, and prone to political blunders. He, however, is loyal and that loyalty has inspired him to become the Marshal today with an undesirable, necessary proposal. In order to ensure that he has the political capital pushed through the military spending that's needed to get to the army into a fit state for the liberation, John intends to pay off a large number of deputies in the assembly. Although he knows that much such corruption is far from ideal and could cause significant problems if leaked, 
Jeanne is certain that if it is the only way forward in light of growing frustration with his government and their abilities. Reluctantly, Patan can only agree. At least, let's hope this can be kept quiet. The White Fa Fathers. Critical to the stability of the regime, the Society of the Missionaries of Africa is a Catholic society of apostolic life focusing on evangelism and education in Africa, founded in 1868 in Algiers. It quickly became an integral part of the colonial society, adapting to native customs, adopting the native dress, all the while accomplishing a tremendous amount of ethnographical and e gra uh, geographic research. They've been on the forefront of the French initiatives on the continent, despite their sometimes strained relationship with an increasingly anti-clerical Republican government. They've become a staunch advocate for the native populations, even accepting native priests, never hesitating to side with them against the colonial authorities when needed, and generally acting as a bridge between the two, earning them the affectionate nickname of White Fathers. In the troubled times since the Revolution, they have become downright crucial to maintaining French authority over what is left of the Empire, working tirelessly to maintain the peace between colonialists or colonists, exiles, and natives with the full support of the Marshal's conservative government. Our Lady of Africa, pray for us and the Muslims. A murder in the Caspa. Shocking news has reached the nation today. Last night, the retired General Henry Mordecai was found dead in the Caspa, having been stabbed repeatedly and left to bleed out in the gutter. Mordecai had a glimmering career in the Great War, successfully holding down the Arras, the town of Arras, against the Germans in 1914 and becoming deeply influential in the Clemenceau government. However, he became far too indebted to the Tiger for his own good, and with the fall of the Clemenceau government, admits a revolution in Fox coup, his political career collapsed. His military career soon followed, with the general staff increasingly wary of his unorthodox theories, nevertheless. By the time of his death, he had become a prolific writer, and his fierce defiance of Clemenceau had made him a prominent figure among liberals, already the right-wing press, notably the Croix de Fou, uh, a line paper Le Flambeau, and of course the Action Francois, pointing the finger at natives, Jews, socialists, and everything in between. Notably, this cause has been taken up by Joseph Darnan. It's the first major scandal broken out since he split from the Croix de Fou, and clearly wants to make a success of it, calling in harsh and term clear terms for crackdown on Algerian nationalists. Many of the Pétain government, even if they lack the same hysteria, are also now calling for an investigation and focus on Arab organizations and cast by possible socialist infiltration, arguing simply and persuasively that these groups were likely behind the old general's death, however, some are arguing that we can't point the finger at any specific group yet, and a much broader investigation is needed. Jeanne's government cabinet has so far has been able to reach a decision, and the premier himself seems dangerously indifferent. As such, the matter has reached Pétain himself and must now come to a decision. The Arabs are obviously behind it, let's claim the Caspa. Can't know for sure, maybe we should dig up deeper. Nah. Nah, we're going to dig right where we want to dig. Marshal Patan's outfit? What oh, shall Patan look like today? I'll keep my army uniform. A new photo of me. Clean off my old suit. I deserve some love. An elaborate fancy looking outfit with a big hat suits, with, suits me well. My old uniform f from the Great War. A reminder of her done. I have a new photo. Oh, new angle. I like it. What's the other one look like? An old suit? The scandal breaks. I knew that surprised few in the know. Janin's corruption has been today exposed, all in its sort of detail. Elaborate bribes, uh, disturbing threats, even promises to turn a blind eye to blatantly illegal activities in exchange for support. All this has been common practice of the Janin government, and all have intensified recently as Janin makes a belated effort to strengthen his hand. Everyone from the saint Lord but Camille Champtemps, to Charles Morel, and Joseph Darnan have harshly rebuked not only Janin but Fetan himself. And although Janin's own fall from power is now certain, to even some speculate that the junta itself is on the way out. Ah, merda. Oh, crap. Widespread protests. Are you freaking kidding me? Um, I just want to see what Patan looks like. Ooh! Look at the line from Verdun. I think it's one more day. I definitely don't want to go to war on the war of stability right now. Ah. Pretty cool. But let's finish the De Gaulle plan first. And the culprits. After, we, after weeks of investigation, loyally aided by numerous white citizens who were present in the cast by the time, it has been clear much beyond doubt that Algerian nationals were at fault for a Mordecai's murder. Although a specific murder had not yet been found, and those we have rounded up have proved notably resilient under interrogation, it's quite clear to all involved that the cells of the socialist and Algerian nationals ENA and its associated groups were responsible. As such, the government resolved to order a new crackdown on nationals of native groups across Algeria and West African colonies, lest this happen again. Meanwhile, Joseph Darnan, whose own nephew aided the police during the investigation, has emerged from his first major, major political test stronger than ever. I want these Arabs to be on bars before sunset. Ooh, this is a bit of get less resistance. Nice. Eid al Hadda. Today, Muslims all over the world celebrate Eid al Hadda, the feast of the sacrifice commemorating the willingness of the Prophet Ibrahim to sacrifice his own son Ishmael as an act of obedience to God's command. Before the killing blow fell, however, God sent Archangel Jibril to substitute the son of a lamb with a lamb to sacrifice instead. In remembrance of this intervention, each family ritually slaughters an animal and shares it on in three. One third going to the poor, one third to the relatives, and one third is kept in Eden. The faithful then go to their local mosque, and at the conclusion of Eid, prayers and sermons exchange greetings, gifts, and visit one another. Considered the holiest day of the Muslim faith, it is always accomplished by, or accompanied by large festivities, and sometimes even the occasion to lower confessional barriers, as some Muslims invite their non-Muslim neighbors and friends to partake in this uniquely Islamic celebration. Eid Mubarak Barak. Eid is it, is it Eid? Is it pronounced Eid or Eid? I think it was Eid. 
Mubarak. The De Gaulle plan. Oh, god dang it. Why did they have to hurt us so badly? Um, so he's gonna fall. It's fine, whatever. No one cares. Um, air stuff. It takes so long, though. But doing this stuff will give us nothing immediately that we can really use. This is not bad. Army XP is nice. Military research. And then we'll go for these two if possible. And industrialize the colonies would be nice, too. You know. Our current industry can never hope to see in a military campaign across the metropole. Ever to have any hope of liberating our brothers and sisters, we must rectify this dire situation and seek to encourage a far greater level of industrial growth across the colonies. Subsidies for new construction projects in both Maghreb and Sub-Saharan territories will begin to get our industrial capacity back on track. Jeanne's resignation. Did the inevitable came to pass, and after two days spent locked away in his office, Maurice Jeanne gave a short, a short, regretful speech to a jeering assembly, announcing his immediate resignation. It, it was clear that Patan himself had forced him out, threatening that if he didn't go quietly, he would lose not only his rank in the army, but his liberty as well. And thus fell the Jeanne in regime. Effect, ineffectual and shambolic to the end. Patan's next move as he attempts a stabilized situation is now for, for now unknown, but members of the crowd, a few, Afar and even AF, have all been meeting, seen meeting with representatives of the Junta. What lies next? That's a great question. What does lie next? Well, I'm making one division at a time because I really want to make these tanks. Uh, we're going to need more tanks. Uh, we need more military factories. Cruise cruiser hulls, huh? I like that one. We'll see. Alright. So with that one, we have to get that one. Um... Well, there's not much else we can do here for now since he's, he's gone, but whatever. Entente trade deals? That's pretty good. Our next move. Uh, ever since Jeanne resigned, the Republic has been without any Prime Minister. And the Junta has been in chaos. With Petain forced to take on the daily administrative responsibilities, he has grown used to delegating. Meanwhile, protests supported by everyone from liberals to alleged legionnaires are continuing in the streets. And we're running out of time to stabilize the situation as such. Two possibilities, but live before Petain. First, as is suggested by many, he could seek to gain the support of civilian politicians through more legitimate means than Jeanne had used. This would entail entering into discussions with either Francois de la Roque, leader of the Coro de Few, or darling of the far right, Louis Marin, leader of the center right Federation Republicaine. Either man would be able to use his political prestige and support base through through confidence in the regime, but also demand extensive concessions in exchange for doing so, something which has inspired some Pétain loyalists to urge the Marshal not to bother talking to any politicians. Civilian politics, they argue, is responsible for dragging France into the chaos it currently faces, and it's time for Pétain to fully secure the Junta's position and bend the assembly to his will. The old marshal must choose a course of action, but he has little time. De La Roque? Maintain the basis of the public, reach out to Marin, declare martial law in Algiers. Well, we're in the Entente still. To get Meet with either Marin or De La Roque. Well, we get stability with that one. We get stability with that one. We get stability. No stability with this one. I guess we go with him. Meet with Marin and De La Roque and refuse the demands. We can get Louis Napoleon. The sixth. Oh, investigate the natives. Meet with, oh wait, meet with Marin or De La Roque. Oh, okay. For this one, wait, Auction Francois. Oh, Morris is that one. Oh, the, I thought they were the same thing. Action Francois is down here. Darnan, though. You get Darnan and the Legion. Ooh, do Jean and Re Ooh. Refuse their demands. Investigate the natives. Refuse their demands. Reach out the far right leagues and don't repeal the law of I'll meet with Darnan. Okay, meet with the Cardinal. As faithfully arranged by Pétain's supporters, the line of Verdun, the respected commander of the Great War, has met with Francois de la Roque, a hero of common sword from the same conflict, while Pétain rose first to the position of Orac's right hand man. De La Roque became active in veterans' groups, joining the right-wing Croix de la Few in 1927, and taking it over two years later, the same year that Pétain succeeded the late Foch as president. Since then, De La Roque has greatly expanded its organization from a vaguely nationalistic group for disgruntled old soldiers to a formidable political movement, advocating for corporatist economics, French nationalism, and a strong presidency. Perhaps predictably, the Croix de Few has so far been glad to support the Junta, gaining the votes of many of Pétain's sympathizers among the public and has been vital maintaining parliamentary support for the Junta. Although De La Roque now promises that he will continue to stand by Pétain no matter what, he today suggested to the Marshal that appointing a new cabinet, dominated by members of the Croix de Few, with himself as Premier, will go a long way to resolving the crisis. He is indeed correct. With open backing from De La Roque's newspaper, Le Flambeau, his paramilitary dispose and his extensive support base, the Junta will surely be able to move on from the crisis. Nonetheless, some allies are cautioning Pétain that granting De La Roque such influence may well lead to the end of the Junta, with De La Roque slowly displacing the Marshal. Like I said earlier, if I pronounce it wrong, I apologize. We have to accept. Um. Nope. Reach out to the far right leagues. Wait. I, uh, meet with them. 
Arrow. Well, we don't get this uh, correct. Well, we'll see. I have plenty of saves just in case, so. We'll see. Tom Dring, yeah. Having turned down his allies' overtures and with the protests going on, Patan is in an increasingly difficult position. Although both De La Roque and Maron have promised that they will continue to stand by the Junta, our refusal to make meaningful concessions to either man is certainly ensure that their support will be hardly vigorous in the coming weeks, and with the protesters going nowhere, this won't be enough. With this in mind, multiple allies of Patan, including both Joan de Gaulle and Admiral Darlan, are now once again urging the Marshal to declare the martial law, arguing that civilian politics has led to this chaos, and it is time for us to move on from it for good. If the Junta is to live on and the Metro Poles be retaken, but our leaders are urging us to make discreet overtures to various far-right leagues to see the support will bolster our image. Martial law it is. Oh, wait, what? Huh. Martial law it is. Uh, we could do that one. Legitimately begin the league supports. Yeah. Don't repeal the law of exile. Ooh. <gasps> handsome man. Handsome, handsome man. Moras' Gambit. Having been quietly contacted by associates of the president looking for backing, Charles Moras, the political philosopher and dominant politician of the Orleanist monarchist and integral nationalist action Francois, or Francais, has seemingly formed a clear impression that the Junta has become a desperate for support. It is with this in mind it appears that he and his allies in the AFT announced a new motion in the assembly to formally lift the law of exile against the royal pretenders, allowing them back in France, although this is not an outright effort to restore the monarchy. That's a crucial first step in doing so, and thus. Uh, oh, my bad. Uh, let's get that one open. And thus, an extremely ambitious move on the part of the Maras. Especially telling was Maras' humble request, or later, repeated in later speeches by Maurice Pujo and Henri Massis, for the support of the President Pétain in his efforts. Of course, such an endorsement for Maras' move would allow the, pack, the act to pass with ease and lead on to a restoration of the monarchy, but it would seem Maras won't take anything less than exchange for support. Give him more backing? Mm -hmm. He would darn on. We'll see what he wants. What's this one? The rights and strikes and stuff? Good god, that sucks. Whoa, his weekly stability goes down. Jacques Bainville. He was born in 1879, was a historian, journalist, and one of the founders of the Action Francois. Today gave a grand speech at the AF meetings in Algiers. Born in a staunch Republican family, he turned to monarchism not out of nostalgia, but out of reflection and comparison. Considering the Republic to be unstable, fickle, and fundamentally incapable to compete with a stable and united Germany. A prolific writer, he ceaselessly exhaled, exalted the French monarchy in his historical works and contributed to many newspapers, simultaneously literary critic and financial analysis. Fleeing to Algeria as the revolution broke out, he wrote in the chaotic aftermath of a short book that quickly became immensely popular, titled The Political Consequences of Peace. Bainville exposes the slots on the peace treaty between CGT and the Germans, stating that just like the Republic is the daughter of Bismarck, engineered to weaken France, the Communists is the daughter of Wilhelm II, creating it to rot France down to her very roots so that she might eventually be turned into a little more than a vassal state in an inevitable coming war. This thesis has become one of the pillars of the rhetoric of the AF, who tirelessly advocates for the fall of one of daughter of the Bok. Uh, so that France might be able to take on the other. Many in our nation are insensible to this kind of talk, as anti-German sentiment has certainly not subsided one bit among exiles. And Bainesville's speech was listened to by thousands of action Algerian members, with political companions, fellow writers, and academic academicians, and even members of the government attending the grand event. The latter Verdun himself has put out a statement honoring the speech and works of the story now seem as profit by many. On grand homme. An offer from Grand Nam. With political instability going ongoing and the rep between the Junta and far right only increasing, something must be done, it, and it seems at last that we have a solution. The minor but none, nonetheless increasingly popular far-right leader, Joseph Darnan, who claims inspiration from the Romanian legionnaires, has approached Patan, Moras, and De La Roque with a proposal for a meeting of national pacification chaired by himself, describing his goals, the unity of the French right behind Patan to strengthen and bring together the nation in preparation for the liberation. Darnan believes that this relatively fringe position to the other men will let him position himself as a compromise candidate and a mediator between them all, in spite of his being significantly more radical than the others. Even if Darnan himself can find little goodwill among Patan's clique, most of the marshals advise it, urging that we take the opportunity to attempt to further unite the nation. Time that insists is running out to resolve the crisis, and must take this opportunity to find allies. We need United Nation to arrange a meeting? Seditious, radical, restore unity where we failed? Yeah, probably. The RSDRP wins Russian elections. Nice. Nice. Social Democratos. The meeting of the National Pacification. Charles Morales and Francois de la Roque 
Uh, the two great rivals of the French right face each other, uh, usually uneasily from opposite sides of the table. Staring distractingly out of the window out of the presidential palace, De La Roque looked at, down at the sprawl of Algiers below. Moras, meanwhile, gazed at the large presidential standard on the op wall opposite, admiring the detail of Pétain's axe symbol. The impending arrival of President Pétain himself, not to mention that of the upstart Danan, hardly reduced attention. In spite of the many differences, neither man could understand what Pétain saw in this deluded new legionnaire, or how Darnan could possibly think he could save all as a nation. But they both needed to appear committed to the national unity. As a, and so they both immediately arrived at the palace in an hour before. The patter of footsteps began to resonate from the corridor outside, and Maras and De La Roque alike abraced themselves for long hours of argument, both knowing it would be in vain. They heard the doors open and what seemed to be the president come in, commenting to an aide. And then the bomb went off, and all the tension, all the robbery was swept away in fire and chaos. Quel catastrophe. Oh boy. The savior of France. Oh. In the aftermath of the presidential palace bombing, the entire nation and administration fell into chaos. With Charles Maras and Francois de la Roque both dead, their parties rapidly fell into chaos, admits in fighting, and more importantly, total shock and astonishment at what had happened. President Patan, for his part, was rushed to a hospital in critical condition, leaving him unable to maintain order while his allies squabbled among themselves. Oh boy. It was only Joseph Darnan who could offer the vision, determination, and strength needed to save France in its hour of need. With the bomb having gone off mere minutes before he arrived at the palace, he was at the center of events from the start. His natural charisma soon allowed him to take charge of the efforts to maintain order, ensuring that the president could safely get to the hospital. Shortly afterwards, understanding the gravity of the situation and how thoroughly France had been betrayed by his politicians, he ordered his loyal militiamen to storm the assembly. With the whole administration thrown into chaos, the brave men faced no resistance. It was not long before Darnan addressed the nation over the radio. An affairist plot, he declared, it was unfolded. The communards bankrolled and aided by the Jews and Freemasons not only of Algiers but also the entire world, and using Algerian nationals as useful idiots, and had conspired to kill Patan, and just how close their plot had come to success, Darnan stated, only showed how complicit that political class was in this disgraceful plot against France itself. The liberals in the assembly with the Jews, the Masonic Lodge of Algiers, the natives, every vile force opposed to the French race, had come together to the state, and it was through its leadership and the glory of France alone that they had failed. Only a radical de revolutionary reorganization of the French state, he announced, could save France from its foes, shortly afterwards having regained consciousness in a hospital a shaken Marshal Patan to confirm Darnand as Premier pour l'ordre nouveau. Oh boy, the Legionary Order of France. Cool. Removing simmering discontent. Awesome. Look at this guy in his beret. I think it's a beret. I could be wrong. Order of the French Legion. The impossible has happened. Joseph Darnand's French Legion and his allies in the militia movement, including La Cougue, which I never know how to pronounce, have taken the reins of power, with Pétain now answering to them in their promise of the total French redemption. It only took us more than half an hour to get here, but that's okay. Uh, a call of Freemasonry. Ooh. Ooh. Daily political power plus point one. Weekly man power plus 20. You basically get the same amount of political power if you do this one anyway, so we're going to go with this one first. The Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard represents those who are most trusted by the Legion leadership, especially Darnan himself. They shall be entrusted with both personal security of our leaders, but also internal intelligence operations and the surveillance of potential subversives. Cole Freemasonry next, though. The pagan secret society that is Freemasonry has long sought to infiltrate French institutions and abuse them for their own designs, fatally weakening us during both the war and the revolution. Now, we can take back what is ours by removing enemies of the French Legion associated with the Freemason movement before they... Strike us again. Oh boy. Nice cigarette, De Gaulle. What a smoker. Join the IASIK? Yeah, might as well do that. I love being a bunch of nap pops. Oh, we are doing Ministry of the Air. For some reason, I thought we weren't. Okay, so did that actually remove. Oh, was I right? Did they. Oh, they did actually remove it. Okay, that's actually really awesome. The devs were smart. Even though they don't like me because I've insulted them too many times. My apologies, devs. I do apologize for how many times I've been really crappy and negative towards them sometimes. My bad. Well, that didn't look too bad. Actually, oh, your weekly war sport, too. That looks really nice. Great track of peels. That's really cool. But, regardless. Boys of the militia, look at this. Oh, what's in a channel? going to do that? Please go ahead. The French militias require both more recruits and more devotion. We need more do to dominate public channels of information and communicate our inspiring message via radio and loudspeaker alike, with a single clear message being communicated by Darnan's Legionary Order Service, helping unify other militia members under him. Uh, more nap pop, political power, command power, map power, action Al Algerian. Algerian. The Fete de la Federation. Militia state, more political power, mobilization speed, recruit both population, surrender limit, weekly war support, plus 1%. Nice. On this 14th of July, we celebrate our national day. Military parades as well as popular street celebrations of fireworks are planned all across France in a joyous celebration of the greatness of our nation. 
For long, what is even celebrated on this day has been a topic of heated debate between the left and the right. The left would insist that this is a day celebrated in the, the 1789 storming of the Bastille Fortress, a Parisian royal prison and armory widely considered at the starting point of the French Revolution, while the right would, on the contrary, consider this a day of commemorating the Fête de la Fédération, a massive holiday festival that took place across France a year later to celebrate the unity of the French nation, and, and at the end of a political struggle of the revolution itself. History proved that hope wrong, but this doesn't stop this debate from rising every year. The 1880 law instituting the National Day on the 14th of July simply abstains from taking a side, but thankfully we have since put the controversy to rest. As an amendment voted by the Assembly some years ago has clarified that we are indeed commemorating the Festival of the Federation today. Either way, let's enjoy ourselves in action or AA. No, but just not alcoholic anonymous. Found in the 20s by Ferhat Abbas in the chaos of the exile, calling itself the principal media outlet of integral nationalism outside, or alongside the main Action Francois, Action Algerian has become one of the most popular newspapers within the Algerian department. Its slogan, From Colony to Province, summarizes its flight or its fight alongside integralist principles, assimilation within a greater France, while still retaining privileges, traditions and local laws against the centralization and disregard for indigenous customs of the Republic, demanding native autonomy and social and economic regulation, universal suffrage in municipal elections, and for native notables to constitute an assembly advising the French government. Abbas has quickly found a resonance among natives, particularly the assimilated elites and the influential indigenous chiefs eager to defend their way of life against an ever-encroaching Republican government. However, the localist proposals of the action is not only the thing that has found resonance among the natives. Its anti-Semitic rhetoric is also proving popular. A legacy of the Cremo Decree, a law that granted full French citizenship to the Jewish population of French Algeria but not to the Arab and Berber Muslim population, remained to this day a century second-class citizens. This wedge between communities that had lived together in relative peace for centuries have proven easy to exploit for the far right, as some groups and parties even promised to repeal the decree to gain support from the natives, either out of genuine ideological, ideological convergence or simply out of pragmatism, as they know that nothing could be achieved without the support, or at the very least, neutrality of the indigenous. Or the indigenous. Nationalists united against the Republic can't be good, says some people. Oh, wait, why didn't I do this one first? Ah, whatever. Hmm. What do we have here? Mobile warfare? You bet your took as we are. The rise of the Socialist Anti-Colonial Committee. Our counterintelligence specialists have noticed a recent surge of cynical activity in our country. We know that the Communist France together with the Union of Britain to establish an anti-colonial committee in the International, which until recently was practically dead. This committee, with the help of Asali, or uh, say Asali, uh, Mohammed Amerian Ben Amerzain, a traitor of the Algerian people, is coordinating with the efforts made by the syndicalists and support uh, and supporting anti-colonial settlements in our French Africa. The syndicalist powers have sent significant amounts of weapons and material to support the native rebels. They've also opened a few training camps in the southernmost parts of the country. While the more radical politicians in our country believe that nothing will come out of this, our generals warn us that we have to be wary. A worrying development. Yeah, can we do this one? Uh, coup dominate capitalism, huh? Legion capitalism, huh? Penalty goes down. 3% more output is not bad. Worse civilian construction speed, but better military factory construction speed. Ultra national Catholicism. Ooh. Local manpower goes down, which sucks. Better just by war goals time. More breakthrough. Additional recruit of population. Just a little bit, though. Underworld connection. Innovation prep time. Recon bonus while entrenched. Army merger. Let's just stay. Ooh. Ooh, that's pretty good. If you want to about Mama, please go right ahead. What does he think he is? A white savior? Nightly rituals? Ooh. French purity. You know, less local non core manpower, but that's okay. Ultra national. Catholicism. The lives of France are those of an uncompromising Christian faith that wars do not shy away from their, to wage war on the chaos and radical materialism destroying this earth. It must embrace their own national Catholicism and the French race as an incontrovertibly linked, promoting legion-friendly priests within the church and demanding an endorsement of our values from the papacy alongside according funds. They must denounce these, those supported Christians who help destroy the true Catholicism in France, such as the liberal Aust Austrian scum who must not be called into a crusade against our foes unless they wish to be destroyed next. Um, dominant Capitalism Capitalist internationalism, materialism, and greed have long sought to subvert our nation, our faith, and unity. While their businesses already rely on state protection, we will directly manage all international finance and trade, only proving what is required for the invasion of the commune while just directly managing industries. Though now Legion members overseeing capitalist owners directly. And by invitation to the IEDC? Oh, I was going to get something here too. Oh, man. Um, if you're going to do this, please go ahead. What, can we do this first? Oh, you know what? Let's try that. I don't know. Let's see. Let's save the game first. Can we spend the political power and then spend some political power here and have negative political power? I'm fine with having negative political power if that's the case. Uh, Army logistics specialists. Army defense. We won't go into the offense, honestly. But we need .09 every day first. 
We do that and then do this. Yeah, we can. Um, army merger. But, oh, advisors. Um, budget collection of defense thirty percent more. Consumer goods factors goes down, and you get more consumer. I mean, I like construction speed. We're getting more consumer goods factors, and fifteen percent more output is going to be super crucial right now. So we're going to get them to the economy. Seven, eight. I only have to out with one. We're going to build. We build a little faster. We've got plenty of guns, light tanks, uh, investment. Ooh, boy. We could really use more cities, but we're not even making any tanks. We just get a tank, tank first at least, right? Humanism integral, integral humanism, the temporal and spiritual problems of a new Christianity. The recently published work of Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain has caused passionate debate among Catholics. A convert from Protestantism, once close to the action Francois, despite not having a monarchist or not being a monarchist, mostly had a suspicion towards representative democracy in opposition to the anti-clerical policies of the Third Republic. Maritain has drifted after the shock of the exile towards more moderate positions, closer to the personalist movement and Christian democracy, rejecting both reaction and liberalism, secularism and intransigent political Catholicism, embracing humanism, arguing for human rights, the importance of family, a pluralistic democracy and responsibility towards the common good, all in the spirit of the social teachings of the church. The philosopher is somewhat going against the grain indeed. Much of the French Catholic laity and hierarchy have been radicalized by the current situation. The AF has even denounced integral humanism as a work of a traitor, a sellout to democratism. A red saboteur, however, among more progressive Catholics, Maritain's works was very well received, getting praise from Father Monti Montini, a close advisor of the Pope, and with some moderates even being drawn away from the action Francois, heeding his work, or his warning that the movement is merely using the faith as a tool to further the political ideology. A new type of integralism, huh? Army merger. Between the Legionary Order Service, La Cougue, the French Legion of Veterans, anti syndicalist Action, Croix de Few, and too many others named, to name, there's simply too many paramilitaries attempting to coordinate with one another, and now with the Army of National France as well. They and the Army shall all be merged into one as commanders from each league are brought into Hill and Dardanon, organized as a single cohesive unit simply called the French Militia, with commanders promising prominence, or promised prominence, after the liberation for the loyalty. Only some organizations remain semi independent, but underneath the, the milice, for internal security purposes, such as Dardanon's Knights of the Sword. Nice. Weekly War Sport 2. Oh, so nice to get. We won't get that relatively early. Uh, I want more artillery. I want more uh, things here, too. Um, get some armor and stuff like that, too. I really want to focus on that stuff. As well as really focus on... Oh. Uh, I really want to focus on tanks and planes. I cast. That's going to be crucial because we have no fuel, but whatever. French purity. Which kind of sucks. We're going to dominate capitalism. Another city is going to be really nice, too. More political power, because I want to get army mergers getting more daily political power, but the dilemma. The Association de Almanes Musulmans Algerians Association of Algerian Muslim Ulema is a religious association founded in 1933. Under the unofficial leadership of the Abdel Hamid Ben Badis, this association of theologians, teachers, and more generally learned men has come to promote Islamic reform, hoping to bring Islam in Algeria to its pure original form away from the superstitions fostered by the Marabouts and the more mystical approach of the Sufi congregations. Taking inspiration from similar initiatives which found success in the Middle East and Tunisia, many schools have already been created teaching grammar, uh, mathematics, and religion to children, and theolo theology, philosophy, history, as well as Islamic and French law to young adults, quickly becoming a major influence of mosques all over the region and attracting the suspicion of colonial authorities. Indeed, one of the stated goals of the association is to foster Islamic identity in Algeria. Do you know the people beyond the divide between Berbers and Kosovo Arabophone, uh, Arabophone Algerians and beyond tribal boundaries? Though they stop short of advocating for independence, they strongly oppose assimilation and claim that an Algerian nation does not exist or does exist, which cannot become French and does not want to be French. As such, they've already found themselves becoming an important player in the politics of the Algerian departments. First, authorities unsuccessfully sought to co-opt the association, much like the arrest of the Islamic clergy in the colonies, as banning the already powerful group would certainly create unrest. Then, two native groups came to seek the support of the ulama, the Action Algerian of the Ferhat Abbas, which claims that they sh should the Action Francois come to power, an autonomous Algerian identity could be fostered, and traditional and, and Islamic law could be fully restored, and a North African of Mesali Hajjid, a syndicalist aligned group, underground group, which advocates for the independence of Algeria with the support of the commune. So far, the association has not sided with either, skeptical of both the sincerity of the AFP's or AF's promises of autonomy and the anti clerical socialism advocated by the communards. Either way, they're probably trouble. French purity. France is simply not a place, but a people. A people resulting from thousands of years of blood and tradition. This cannot be forgotten, as French blood and purity will be rewarded and promoted within society, and those who have subverted, such as Jews and natives, and worse of them all, those who breed with foreigners, will be treated accordingly. Underworld Connections In Nice and Corsica, there remains members of the milieu who oppose the uh, syndicalist revolution who remain on good terms with Darnan's legion. Their Praetorians will attend connections with them for men, who supply most poorly information. Alpha Landon, oh boy. Now, the rituals. We are the knight French of French knights of old were born. Uh, and to sent to make France whole again as we should act as such. Tally regulated in the rituals, ceremonies, and initiation rituals will increase our prestige and loyalty uh, from loyal soldiers. 
The internal enemy. Ideal of, of youth. Legionary outreach. I like the internal enemy. Even in our fort of French nationalism, the internal enemy waits to strike. The Jews, liberals, unruly capitalists, even the supposedly conservative critics of our order, must be purged if we are to avoid further sabotage and espionage. We should not repeat the mistakes of the First World War by allowing them to run rampant, and we must be pure if we are to redeem the mainland. Whoa. Ooh, more tanks. I like that. The Grand Master. Ooh. Total sacrifice. Yes, please. Colonial pacification? Yes. The beautiful war. Oh, we just go straight to war with them. Nice. I do want to do this one as well. Total air war? That's not bad. Um, do that. Definitely do this one as well. Yeah. If you're going to do that again, please go right ahead, bud. Yeah. Professional army as well, but the papacy refuse to support us. How dare they? And ex move expected by all, but perhaps the most ardent supporters of Darnon and the Legion. His Holiness, the Pope, has flatly refused to even consider the Legion's brand of Catholicism. Along with this, the Vicar of Christ has threatened to excommunicate Darnon and the leadership of the Legion. This flat rejection from the most important man in Christendom of our ideals has led Grand Master Darnon to conclude something he has, he has long feared. The Church herself has become infected by the vile poison of the Freemasons. This infection was able to reach the highest levels of the Church's earthly leadership, and swayed the recent conclave to elect a man who has no right to the papacy, of course. While us, the man was smitten and prayed that his evil influence would be purged by the hand of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the hand of the Lord. Joseph Darnon is no such man. No, the Grand Master must do what is necessary to save the Bride of Christ, and he shall do what he must to this end. Darnon, over the past few days, since receiving the Roman pretender's response, has been preparing to call a new uh, conclave. Due to the nature of this emergency and the lack of cardinals who know the truth of the papacy, there none has encouraged the French clergy to embrace the historical election of the Pope by the entire faithful of Rome. While most clergy that uh, there none its approach initially responded negatively, once they were fully made aware of the, to understand the situation, most of the important members of the colonial clergy have formally consented to this new conclave. Interestingly enough, His Eminence Eugene Gabriel Gervais Laurent Tesserant, one of the last people to be made a cardinal by Pope Pius XI, has come in total support of this new conclave. With this support, and the support of God, which we no doubt have, the church shall be saved from itself. May the conclave begin! A new pope for the new France. After a long, intense week, the emergency conclave called to the behest of the Grand Master Darnam. The secretive meetings held within the Cathedral of St. Philip has come to a close, and while white smoke has filled the airs of Algiers. To fill the vacancy left by the death of Pius XI, the conclave elected the young Marcel Lebre. Lebre, despite being only a priest, as one of the most traditionalist priests that filled the ranks of the clergy. Upon his election, Father Lebre. Ra took the name Pius XII as a way to honor the legacy of the late Pius XI, and to show his desire to carry on the legacy of Pius X. Pius XII has, of course, been commanded by the Roman pretender, along with, uh, commended by them, uh, with among the most church outside of a bastion of the true France. Despite these commendations, we shall hold fast, as with God as a witness, that the true line of papal succession has been restored. May God give us the strength to restore the true vicar of Christ. Habemus Papum. And rebellion will die. The natives will die of armed and organized for weeks as a result of our colonial policies. They have now assembled a strong enough force to declare independence of a declared open revolt against our rule. Which was my bad because I didn't realize at the time of this recording. Um, I originally put this as uh, local autonomy, which because we were relatively like authoritarian and democratic, which we had. But now we are in civilian oversight, and now we don't have enough garrisons here, which uh, really sucks. Yeah, that really sucks. So um, we could do this. The natives in Wadi have, or have armed and organized for weeks as a result of our colonial policies. Uh, they now have somewhat a strong enough force to declare independence and have open declared revolt against rule. I'm not sure how strong them to arms. Use what resources and loyalists we have in the region to crush these upstarts. Due to our limited resources, uh, we are only able to suppress the revolts once. Go and do that for now, I guess. It's probably better to do the other one, but... Immaculacy Conception de Ogadogu. Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception of Ogadogu was consecrated today in the presence of Joseph Darnan, governor of Haut Volta Henri Louis Joseph Chesse. And Johnny Thévonu, the very influential apostolic vicar of the city of Ogoda, Ogadogo, who was some whispers the true governor of the colony, the first cathedral to be consecrated in the Sahel. The Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception takes inspiration from the both traditional African building uh, techniques and Romanesque architecture. It stands as a powerful symbol of the success of the missionary work within the French colonial empire, and especially that of the Perez Blanc. It is also the crowning personal achievement of the Monsieur Thévenot, whose presence in the city has made an unrivaled impact. Arriving in the city in 1903, he immediately reached out to the local Monsi chiefs and got to work building schools, a seminary, developing the land, and implementing industry slowly but surely making the nation or making the mission the economic heart of the city, if not the whole region. Two years after his arrival, there were already more than a thousand catechumens under his supervision, and the number of converts had grown exponentially since then. As for the rumors that he is a true governor of the colony, it is undeniable that through this personal charisma, experience, and diplomatic skills, and growing economic influence, Monsieur Thévenot 
wields considerable influence, often acting as an intermediary between the colonial administration and traditional power structures. He has been an important and outspoken part of the administrative council of Halt Volta for more than a decade now, and was a severe critic of the Algiers regime's handling of the famines of the early 1930s. Another vote that followed. However, the apostolic vicar has always dismissed claims that the true power in Halt Volta lies with him, presenting himself as nothing more than a humble missionary, blessed with some success, caring for his flock. A living saint, that Thenevoud. How glorious. We got quite a bit of political power too, which is really nice. So, uh, second accidental schism, oil from Romania. What do you mean, ac oh, oh, not accidental, but accidental schism, yeah? Papal schism, what is this, the 1300s? Well, according to the Romans, or the, the, the guys, the false pretender in Italy, yeah. Romania, like most of the Europe outside of the Stenicalist nation, has been significantly hit by the economic crisis caused by Black Monday. In order to alleviate the situation, the Romanian representatives in Algiers approached us uh, to a negotiated new trade deal. This treaty would ensure a steady supply of much new oil for us at a reasonable price, along with the preferential tariffs between our nations. More trade is always good. As a bigger partner, we should get more favorable terms. At least we need housing cheap foreign imports. You know what? Let's see. If this goes well, maybe we'll get even more oil. I hope it goes well for us. Let's save, and bigger part, we should get more favorable terms. Right now, we're going to go with cast as well, which would be very nice. And what else? Yeah. Can we get anyone here? Oh, I guess we can. Do we have more daily army XP? I'm going to go and go to partial mobilization, though. Army merger still, of course. I mean, if you want to do that again, you can go right ahead, but whatever. Um, I still want to get, like, all this up here, too. I mean, uh, that's, that can definitely wait. We'll definitely do this route, too. But wait, we can definitely wait. Definitely want that one too. The Romanians walk out. God dang it. The Romanians refused to counter offer and the deal fell through completely, of course. It's their own fault for disrespecting us. Well, sour relations with Romania as they struggle to get the country back on track, of course. Turn on enemy. Yeah, pretty good. Boom! Nice. Today, Charles Trent, a famous and well accomplished singer songwriter known for his songs like Boom, appeared in a recruitment office in Algiers, wearing his father's first Veltric uniform, which he had, he had taken with him when his family, family fled to us. To end exile. He volunteered for the army, went into a long spiel about the whole coming reconquest of his inflamed his patriotic feelings, and he wishes for nothing more than to die for his country. The government, however, has a different view. Trenant is a valued cultural icon already and has read hundreds of, written hundreds of songs, as most recent only being released a week ago. But to die fighting the Metropole could hurt the always fragile public morale. However, to turn him away out of hand would just make an enemy out of a, a loud public voice. So, the government has come up with a compromise. Despite Trinit having zero combat experience or background, he's been rolled into officers training school to leader men. He keeps them out of reasonable danger while also keeping him in the army. A delightful situation for all involved. A singing soldier? Who ever heard of such nonsense? Absolute, absolute nonsense. At the same time, we're going to raise a conscription level too because we will need more um, power. Uh, or maybe we should get... Maybe do it more daily army XP first. No, we are going with armor. Speed and breakthrough is not bad. I want more daily army XP as well. Um, more, just more plane attack is good. Organization is so strong. I love it. I kind of do want to go with that one. But armor technology? You get more attack. More max speed. More breakthrough for armor technology as well. Oh, that's pretty good. Puau? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Speed and breakthrough. Speed and breakthrough. Same guy, basically. Jean... I like the less supply consumption too, because that could be very, 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 very helpful. Division organization, though. Because that can help everybody. Or just say screw it and choose Gabriel. Just be, just to be different. Like, I almost use all the, the other ones usually, and I might be gimping ourselves here, but whatever. Um, underworld connections, of course. Uh, let's take a look see here. Stand up in America. Uh, we have been hit. One of the social terrorist cells operating in the country has pulled off a vicious act of sabotage. Thankfully, nobody died, but a few facilities were hit. You scum suckers. 1937. Keep going with that stuff, too. At least we have four research slots, which is very nice. Uh, resistance is going down 41%, 41%, 41, 41, 41. Resistance. There's a lot of resistance here. 38%, which is nice. Um, compliance is actually not too bad. I mean, 32%. That's pretty decent. 41% is pretty darn decent, too. It's still not going up, though, but whatever, because we don't have enough guns, but we're working on it, you know. In the meantime, let's go ahead and create an agency just so that we can up, up, get an operative, so we can help put, put down some resistance. Of course, underworld connections, ideas of youth, uh, ideas of youth, huh? strength, vitality, action. The positive attributes of youth are not to be understated, and as such, militia schooling with an emphasis on recruiting young men and upholding the ideal of physical fitness shall be implemented at once. Eid, if you want to read Eid again, please go ahead. It's March 9th, 1937. Legionary Outreach. We're not alone in desiring a free world, a world of free madness, and a return to spiritualism and a rightfully earned warrior hierarchy despite our current disagreement over the details. Both Evola and the Iron Guard of Endorse our esoteric and traditional return, and as such we should reach out to them and like-minded allies in Spain. 
Uh, French World Connections, not really rituals. Um, 35 days. Manpower, stability, political power. We could really use more stability. Um, more support's not bad over here. But this does influence how much political power we get, so let's do the ideals of youth. We'll do this one, nightly rituals, eternal enemy, religionary output. And depending on what happens next, of course, we could do is industrialize, ministry, uh, divisible. Yeah, we gotta get there first. So we got a little bit more time to wait, I suppose. Um, that's not bad either. Ooh, what is this one? La Mom Piaf. Militia corporatism. That's not bad. Two military factories and a naval dockyard. Grand Master. More daily political power, weekly war support. We must end the trade of failed defender France. Baton being our leader when we have one, but one chief for the French, Joseph Darnam. Baton will respectively retire in the Grand Marshal of Malice. Which will be granted a vastly expanded executive power, militia corporatism. It is time for further strength in our grips of the market. The market has done its time and it has its merits, unfortunately. The capitalists only think of getting rich at the expense of the country. They're blooded brothers in a national cause. Under Darnam, uh, this is no longer the case. The market will still be monitored and controlled by our proud legionnaires of the brave sons of the eternal France because they are most able to serve it, and total sacrifice. Passive support for the cause will not do if we are to take back our homeland and citizenry, the citizenry must give all. Every man who can serve or produ produce must. Every woman who can serve in an auxiliary shall. Every gun and vehicle that goes underused must be the militias. We'll not lose what for want of manpower resources. We will squeeze this colony of every drop of sweat and blood. Uh, Edith Gassion, better known as Le Mon Piaf, meaning the little sparrow in Parisian slang, has recently become a sensation of France on both sides of the Mediterranean. During both the Valkyrie to a failed singer, born to a failed singer and street acrobat, raised in a brothel for most of her childhood in the torment of the revolution. She was nonetheless blessed with an incredible voice. Her harsh life has given her a haunting depth and sensibility. Having started her career as a street singer, she quickly started performing in cabarets and workers' clubs, singing about working class life and struggles. Soon, she was on the radio and negatively her songs would cross the sea in embargo. Her records are playing in the packed clubs of Algiers as Frenchmen let the nostalgia of their homeland be soothed by Piaf's striking Parisian accent and tales of the atmosphere of the shitty part of the City of Lights. Some find her songs scandalous, while others insist these songs are coded in cynicalist propaganda. But the government is doing nothing to stop the spread of her records, and it's rumored that she has admirers in high places. Amusingly, she's proved equally controversial in the commune. There, she's been accused of encouraging bourgeois degeneracy and singing kind of revolutionary propaganda about the living conditions of the proletariat. Though, thankfully, these complaints fall on equally deaf ears. Maybe we'll hear her perform live someday. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we will continue with uh, our legionary Older of France. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.